Uh. All right. So, um, so wow, you, you, you asked for this, although it's only something that we've been interested in. So do you want to, you want to kick off what you were thinking about or, um, Yeah, putting me on the spot like that. That's not very nice of you. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, in all seriousness, the, um, the problems of, not, not the problem, the, the things we've been discussing has been a lot to do with how we're going to test stuff once we go on to a containerized environment. And I mean, testing at scale and making sure that things still behave as they are supposed to behave. And for, well, since ever, we've been relying on technology for all of this. May it be internally, may it be in the CP lab. And that's where most of the Ceph testing coverage is. It's, it's in technology. It's in nothing. Nothing else compares to how thorough tautology really is when it comes to testing stuff. And so it makes sense to find a way to run tautology against a containerized environment. And, and, and this is where the, the problem begins, is what is the, the real scope that we, we, we intend to, on which we intend to use tautology whether tautology is just going to be the test, testing framework being supplied with a Kubernetes cluster and then just it's magic, or whether tautology will also have the responsibility to deploy said cluster, especially when we start having Rook involved. How does Rook fit into the, the whole thing? Is tautology responsible to also deploy Rook? and test Ceph against different versions of Rook, should that be necessary? How will we test upgrades? So this is the 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 complexity matrix starts to, to grow quite a bit. Yeah. And we've discussed a bit of that internally, but regardless of what we discuss internally, it always ends up, we always end up the, the buy-in from the other stakeholders of Ceph because it doesn't make sense to just throw resources into this and, well, eventually potentially diverge, which is basically wasting resources on all parties. Um, so this meeting with a lot of more people that actually know what we need rather than me. Um, yeah. So that's... So yeah. Yeah, that's about where I am too. I do have I do have have a few more things, which is that um so we've already identified as a critical gap that Ceph or that Tutology doesn't test installation methods right now. So whatever we do with this, we're gonna need to test, you know, like I, I think we do need to t cover testing Rook that it works. Um and depending on how quickly we go to the all Kubernetes environment, if that actually happens, then we also need even to like test Ceph Ansible and stuff. Um so that's the only thing that needs to happen. And that would sort of push me towards saying, all right, well, we should just like have Tuthology deploy Kubernetes clusters in, in the in the CP lab, except I have no idea how expensive that actually is. Um, and there's a lot of things you want to change or fix about the Tuthology framework too. And so Sage for one has always suggested that we just like, like, you know, we'll keep pieces of Tuthology around and call it Tuthology, but that we just run Kubernetes on the lab. And make that a prerequisite for for running Tuthology, and that we can then like inherit those job schedulers and placement things, and just schedule tests against containers, and let that just and let Kubernetes handle that for us. And that's the point where I run out of knowing what a good plan is because I really don't understand Kubernetes that well. I, I I'm kind of very much along the lines of what you were just saying. Stage's position was. Um, I think that even having Tuthology deploy Kubernetes is not necessarily something we want to do. Um, so we can maybe do something like having a bit uh, like a per rack or whatever Kubernetes cluster. Um, and instead of having 
toothology sort of lock nodes by doing all its own scheduling stuff. It can lock nodes by applying some labels to the Kubernetes nodes. Um, and then when we schedule the containers within a particular toothology run, we would say, you know, run on these labeled nodes. I think I think we do need some level of um, per run isolation on top of Kubernetes. We probably don't want to jump straight to having multiple runs share share nodes for running their services. Um, but um, if we do it that way, then Toothology itself doesn't need to know how to create a Kubernetes cluster, which I think would be a big a big win from a complexity point of view. Yeah, that's actually that's pretty much exactly what I was going to propose here. Um, so if if you if you look at the the, the way we currently use OpenStack, um, it uses this this uh, it uses this libcloud backend that I wrote I don't know a year and a half two years ago, um, and part of the part of the concept of that backend is you can in your configuration define um, define machine types, like sort of virtual machine types that correspond to a given OpenStack configuration. And so when you try to lock a node of that machine type, what it really does is it goes and creates one, it creates instance, an instance in, in the cloud that corresponds to, you know, to the one that, that you passed in via configuration. So we could do something similar where, um, I don't know if I guess it's appropriate to to still look for individual machines that are inside of a Kubernetes cluster, um, based on what you just said, John. Um, but a a an additional you know uh, provisioning backend for Toothology could could feasibly say, all right, I I want to either select you know instead of a node, I want to select this entire Kubernetes cluster and then uh, deploy on that. Or if you need to. It, it, if if somehow selecting individual machines in a given cluster is relevant, that seems possible too. Um, it seems like deploying Kubernetes itself is is maybe not the first step we want to take, but I don't know what the real requirements are. Yeah, from Rook's perspective, I mean Rook assumes that Kubernetes is running also, and you know, we have a, a simple test framework for our integration testing that. Uh, it does you know, use kubeadm to start up a one node kubernetes cluster and when it's done it you know it tears it down and it's done it's just a aws or gce run so it's simple but if you ha actually have a full scale out lab i don't think we'd want to necessarily bring up kubernetes every time we want to test something like kubernetes is just there um you know, hopefully there could be some yeah some external process to the whole test framework which knows how to set up uh, Kubernetes, but then, yeah, once that's going, yeah, we could certainly use the the node labels and and things to um, to tell Rook where to run the Mons and OSDs and other daemons, and yeah, that's all definitely possible right now. So um, is it is it the case that many Rooks can coexist on the same Kubernetes cluster? Yes, they can. Uh, it's I don't. Uh, it takes a little bit of care and things to make sure you label your nodes correctly and and tell things where to run so that you don't have them stomping on each other but it, it is possible i mean the, the normal customer scenario is just run one cluster because you need one store set of storage for your for your cluster but it's possible to partition it like that has is um is that sufficiently uh, cover testing rook or are we going to need to be able to run it against multiple Kubernetes versions frequently? Uh, I mean, the the Rook, our integration testing that's automated with every PR and every merge, it, it does run against the versions of Kubernetes we support. So we spin up Kubernetes 1.8, 9, 10, and 11 right now to go run the tests against it. Um, if it's... For scale out testing, um, I don't know how important it would be to test against all the different versions, but certainly it, I guess it would be an, a good idea to have some sort of matrix there. A way to accomplish that might be using the, the sort of idea I just described. Um, if we just have several Kubernetes clusters running in, for example, the Sepia lab, 
um, Greg's making a face. Um, it, it would make this possible, though. Um, at schedule time, you tell it what what air quote machine type to use, and it could go and select the proper cluster. Um, yeah, we kind of we kind of need to model Kubernetes versions the same way we do operating system versions at the moment. So, like we used to, we used to have machines that were statically configured to different OSs and schedule on them. We moved toward um, dynamically installing the OS we want, and the the equivalent to that with Kubernetes would be to like reimage some nodes with a particular version with a particular operating system and a particular version of Kubernetes on them. But I wonder if that's maybe something that we need to think we need to kind of do that later um, rather than jumping right to that because doing doing that sort of matrix of Kubernetes versions and Rook versions and Ceph versions feels like quite far away from where we are at the moment, which is not having any testing of Kubernetes at all. Yeah, so that's that's true, but the problem is that testing Kubernetes by dynamically installing that is sort of the opposite of just having a Kubernetes cluster that we run inside of and rely on for scheduling. Right, so I guess what I, what I was trying to say was that that, that fancy, fancy matrix testing, which might require having more automation to build up Kubernetes clusters on demand is, is a can that we should kick down the road a little bit so that we can do the simpler thing to begin with, where we just have, for, and not just to begin with, but for most of our testing most of the time, where we just have like one big Kubernetes cluster. Yeah, I I, I was kind of to agree. Yes. I think no, I, I'm <laughs> saying that I'm inclined to agree. Go ahead, Blaine. I, I've been kind of viewing it differently. Uh, when when I went through and, and tried to develop requirements for a, a shared development environment all on one Kubernetes cluster, there like there still is a considerable amount of work that needs to be done to make some sort of automated system where root clusters aren't going to stomp on each other. And it, uh, I mean, from from my perspective, it's easier to spin up a Kubernetes cluster, just a brand new Kubernetes cluster on however many nodes you want and install a root cluster on that because then you don't have to worry about the specific rook configuration for how it's not going to stomp on another rook uh, in in the same cluster and getting all of your namespaces right and making sure that when you want to know that it gets labeled correctly and then that no other pods are still trying to be scheduled on that node with that label. Uh, there's, I, I think there are a lot of, there, there are a lot of moving parts with the single cluster Kubernetes where you're testing multiple rooks. And that that is the can that I would kick down the road. I think yeah. if, if we were testing anything other than Ceph, if we were testing another application um, where one of our supported configurations for our users was to have multiple instances of that application within a given data center, we, I think it would almost be like a given that you would expect them to safely coexist and be able to safely test multiple versions within the same Kubernetes cluster. I guess Ceph is a little bit different in terms of you know how we go around stamping on hard drives and that kind of thing. But my my perhaps over optimistic gut feeling is that if sharing Kubernetes clusters is something we want the software to be able to do, then it's almost a good thing for us to be taking that pain in our testing environment um, so that that's sort of the standard way of doing things rather than for us to do all our testing on the assumption that we have a cluster to ourselves and then have our users potentially run into uh, the, the sort of practical realities of, of sharing. I mean, I mean, that is a thought that I also had when I was going through the sort of exercises thinking about a development environment. And like, it's it's a valid thought. I I still am of the opinion that planning for that eventual reality is good, but what we execute now is likely going to be um, uh, like a quicker path forward in the short term 
and then maybe that means that in the short term for the next couple Ceph releases, we don't officially support uh, multiple clusters in the same Kubernetes cluster until we have good testing of one cluster in a Kubernetes cluster. Yeah, I guess that comes down to what's which is less work, the the sort of setup and tear down and isolation of multiple routes within a Kubernetes cluster versus the setup and tear down and isolation of multiple Kubernetes clusters within an estate of physical hardware. I'm not I'm not sure I have an intuitive sense of which of those is greater since I've never not the only yeah. task. also mean to like maintain testing of not Rook and not Kubernetes. Um, so I've been told that it's possible to run systemd inside of containers, and so we can keep on doing things with like Ceph Ansible and our systemd units and stuff. And I have no idea how plausible that is or how much it overlap it actually has with real customer deployments that aren't using Kubernetes yet or users. And I, I, so I know we're all in on Kubernetes and you want us to be there and that's the world, but it's it's not going to be a snap of the fingers. <laughs> So I, I'm kind of conscious that the stuff we're talking about now is a comparatively long-term project and that we're we're sort of talking about things today that yet yeah, we need the initial versions of quite soon, but this might not be fully rounded out for, for a year or two. Um, and in a year or two, we hope that much more of the world will have, you know, joined us on the on the grand Kubernetes bandwagon. Um, and in the but in the meantime, for for people who want to test outside of Kubernetes, well, they already have their test framework, right? They have the existing test framework. Um, the question is whether we whether we need to build something new for testing Ceph Ansible. And my my feeling about that, and this is all very opinionated, of course, um, is that we've gone like four or five years with this current situation of Toothology doing things its own way and there also being these external tools that weren't in use in Toothology and either got tested separately or got tested less or got tested manually or whatever it is. And if the if the impetus was that strong to create a new framework to automate testing of things like Ceph Ansible within our normal Ceph testing, it would have happened by now. You know, I just don't think the, the push is that strong to, to do that. Well, okay. Um, the push is much stronger now than it was six months ago. And it's not that we want a new framework, but that we want these things to be included within Toothology. Um, more than that, if you think that what we're doing with Kubernetes isn't going to be like a Kubernetes testing framework isn't going to exist for a year or two, how do you think we're going to get there if it's not incremental? And I'm not like, I want to be clear, I don't actually have an opinion about most of these things. I just don't I want to know what a path looks like and that it covers the matrix of testing we need. And I don't, I don't see how that happens yet, mostly because I don't no, see I'm, not, I'm not saying it wouldn't exist for a year or two. I'm saying that it wouldn't like be the sort of, uh, we wouldn't retire the alternatives for a year or two, I think is what I mean. But do you think um, we're going to gradually like shrink the existing Toothology managed lab and allocate hardware towards Kubernetes clusters? Because maybe I hate that. <laughs> um, Why do you think that? Because it's because it's not dynamically allocating the resources where we need them when we need them. Sure, but the only way you get a dynamic allocation that supports like any backend, um, i.e., Kubernetes or non-Kubernetes, is if you install some other like cloud, right? So if you in well, so that's so, so the hmm. yeah. So that's why I was asking about testing other things inside of Kubernetes, like. Can we do a reasonable facsimile of testing stuff Ansible with systemd or DeepC with systemd inside of a Kubernetes cluster? Right, um, just, just to be clear here, when we're talking about testing Ceph Ansible, DeepC, whatever, we're actually just talking about calling on those things to actually do the deployment, right? Or the management. Well, and and also managing our daemons with right with the init the system. Deployment expect, management. Yes. Yeah. Things like that. We're not yeah. actually running the testing it in any other way, just to ensure that they actually do what we need them to do. Yeah. Okay. So, so we we do test with Ceph Ansible now. 
Eh. Uh, not, I'm sure we don't as much as run. we would like to. There are tests that run with stuff Ansible, but um, we really need to start installing, like, like we need we need an in an installing API inside of Toothology that lets you install with whatever ha whatever installer has a task written to do that and sets up the world so it works. Um, well, we can maybe, maybe we do and maybe we don't, right? Because we, okay. we either we I'm either being... take on this. <laughs> I'm being told that we do, and we have, and and, and we at Red Hat have, ex have experienced several serious problems because we don't. Hmm. But what what I'm saying is is that you you can either take the view that the core set project should take on the burden of testing, you know, n different installers, um, or you can take the view that the core set project tests Ceph and one preferred installer um and, and that's, that's fine but the preferred installer has changed many times over the years many more times than the testing system we use has changed and while i know everyone's on kubernetes right now and it's great i don't think that we're going to stop when we get there so no no, no but that's, that's so i'm not saying kubernetes is what we're going to be using in 50 years time um then again neither is Seth. um but when we decide we want to move to a different framework, we we move, right? We rewrite to a different framework rather than in rather than trying to maintain a a sort of multi-headed thing throughout the whole process. Right. If we if we adopted Kubernetes today and then in five years we decide we want to adopt something else, then great. In five years we change the code to use something else. But we don't spend five years maintaining a system which is more complex because it knows how to use two different installers. Right, and to be honest, re regardless of how much testing deep sea deployments and upgrading and whatnot would be useful to us as well, I personally believe that I, I personally agree with John. I do think that if it's in any way possible or feasible, it would be nice if Tosology would be pluggable enough to just have people write whatever is their poison of choice and do their own testing on it with whatever. Maybe that's possible already, but I, I'm i not familiar enough with the Tology's inner workings to actually assess yeah. that. I haven't I, spent I, as much time looking at it as I want to, but it's, it's less bad than I thought when I was, when I was skimming through things. Um, like, it's mostly the Ceph cluster install and setup test that, that, that deals with that. And we actually, like, I thought that we were doing a lot of raw Ceph OSD invocations with the Thrasher and stuff, but we actually don't. Um, so it's really just a few places you need to, you need to poke at to switch things right now. Um, and well, if, if I recall correctly of how things worked, um, the, the idea I have is that Tautology has a bunch of primitives that allows us to just run like destroy OSDs, monitors, stop them, start them, all of that. Yeah. And well, assuming those are abstracted and there's a module or something or black magic, Python black magic, um, we can still have tautologies primitives doing that, or we can have whatever other primitives there are that may be deep sea sensible. Yeah, whatever. so that's that's what why I'm calling. asking what's possible inside of Kubernetes. <laughs> um, there's also no, and, and that would also be useful for oh. Rook, I guess, right? Yeah. Or yeah. For, um, although Rook would be via the, the manager, but Tautology could have that thing to actually call to the manager. Right, right. so that's I, I was about to say the the sort of interface that that you're describing to let um, Tuthology drive different orchestrators is going to look very similar to the orchestrator interface within the manager. Um, right. And that's, you know, it's not a, it's not a trivial thing, right? We've, we've kind of spent a reasonable amount of time already um, trying to sort of whittle down that interface into something which is reasonably minimal, but also general enough for the different backends and 
we're already at a point where we have you know some stuff that just had to be different right where the different backends can't do things the same way like some of them require explicit placement of some demons some of them will schedule demons for you dynamically um some of them support groups of drives some of them don't um and if we actually wanted to go down that route then maybe we should be looking more at um Tufology driving Ceph Manager, right? So Tufology would know itself how to set up Ceph Manager and Ceph Monitor, but then for everything else, when it wanted to schedule OSDs and whatever, it would just do that via Manager, um, so that it was using the same paths that a user would hopefully be using, um, if we wanted this sort of multi backend type environment. I I think the the problem I see with that is that I mean de deploying things. And testing that the deployments and like adding OSDs and things get done is good, but there there is also sort of the case where you want to just like full stop an OSD or or like crash a monitor or something, and that that has to look different for the different backends. Like for something that runs on hardware, you just kill it and make sure systemd doesn't restart it automatically. For 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 Rook, you have to kill it in some sort of way that Rook isn't going to try to recreate it automatically. Um, assuming that that's the testing that, that you even want, want to be doing, I suppose, to, to start with, you know, the testing what happens when a monitor has failed could be something entirely separate from that. Uh, but we're, we're kind of, or at least as I see it, we're kind of at a place now where we're, we're, Tuthology has to be semi-aware of whatever it's running on top of in order to know what tests are actually uh, relevant, like tests that are relevant in Kubernetes might not be relevant in uh, on bare metal and vice versa. Yeah, so something that I think will help clarify is to separate the discussion of is the test framework supporting multiple you know, deployment locations or you know do we need to run them on the same hardware because i think running trying to run the you know the bare metal tests on the same nodes where kubernetes is running that that to me doesn't seem like we should try that um, you know or try and get systemd to work on the same place that kubernetes is running like let's just say this is only a kubernetes cluster and uh, and separate that discussion at runtime so yeah does is that fair to make that statement that that we don't need to run the different um, systems on the same hardware? Or can we assume if Kubernetes is there, we're just going to run the Kubernetes tests? It's not unfair, sense. but it's, it's a little sad because it means that we need to improve Tuthology in all the ways that it's weak and support Kubernetes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. Which yeah, which so. would be the case. Um, but that's I mean, that's what you end up with if you if you don't fully buy into one platform, right? You have to you have to go and build everything yourself in addition to whatever the platform can do well, for you. No, I mean for instance, it could be that we fully buy into running on top of Kubernetes, but that we maintain the ability to test other things within that platform, um, so that we can use Kubernetes job scheduling, but we run VMs as containers or whatever it takes. Um, to do other kinds of testing within that environment. Um, yeah, really, uh, running in Kubernetes requires running pods, which start Docker images. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, no, but that that yeah. I think brings us to what Blaine was talking about, because as soon as we move to Kubernetes, there are a lot of operations for which semantics may change. You you cannot simply kill a monitor and expect it to be down or stop it even. Um, because as far as I understand, Kubernetes will, or maybe Brook, will restart those those demons, those pods, because it feels like, well, because it wants Ceph to be happy and as happy as possible. So if something is not working properly, it will likely just restart it or some form of operation, recovery operation, right? And there are ways to make it not do that but yeah it's true that you need you need the hooks that are aware of the platform yeah so um 
So it, I think it was two weeks ago when we first discussed this this meeting. John mentioned something that I I actually agree with. Ensuring that tautology itself is nothing more than a, a testing framework and remove a lot of the craft. I, I think that was your point, right, John? I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, pretty pretty much that tautology should be should be a test runner and not a virtualized lab manager, no right. deployer thing. Um and and I I agree with this. Then I, I got to talk, I think it was with Blaine. Blaine mentioned this whole um semantics or possible semantics change. And I, I'm I'm now just trying to figure out whether just having tautology as a, a simple testing framework would be possible without some form of platform awareness. Because I, I have the feeling that it isn't really. Although it would be amazing if we could simplify tautology enough to a point that writing tests to it would be easy, running tautology itself would be easy, and all the other things around tautology could be there. Yes, we could have platform-specific projects or something, a deployer that would deal with the deployment, setting up, all of that. Um, but basically, it could be split that, tautology in yeah. multiple projects or sub-projects. A, a useful way to, to deal with the issue of hooks um, might be to say that rather than tautology having to be aware of the different orchestrators, that we just say, if you want to be a Ceph orchestrator, you need to expose the following set of standard hooks. Right? That way, tautology doesn't have to be pluggable. Tautology just can do whatever it needs to do with any suitably compliant orchestrator, and it's all open source, so we can, you know, change the orchestrators however we want to let them expose things. Yeah, I I really like that idea. I think yeah. if we're talking already about supporting a new backend, and already you know we're saying, well, we're not going to be running Kubernetes forever. What comes after Kubernetes? I think it makes sense to start planning for. Uh, for us to be able to separate the concerns out more distinctly to make sure, you know, Toothology only tests Ceph and that there are things that can plug into that for scheduling hardware or for, uh, uh, you know, installing operating systems or installing or, or you know, like running a deep sea test suite or Ansible test suite, you know, that, I mean, to me, those things do seem in addition to Ceph and not the same as Ceph. Okay, so I understand separating concerns, but I don't really understand the distinction that John was drawing about compliant operators and how that means not having to make changes to tutology. So what I'm saying is um, <clears throat> if I've got Ceph Ansible and Rook and they both have different ways of killing a service, um, then what we have been discussing was having Tuthology know both ways of killing a service, right? Um, so it would have to know here's an API call you do on Rook and here's like a command you run on Ceph Ansible. Whereas the other way around to do that is um, to say that Tuthology, when it wants to kill a service, will always, for example, um, run the following command um, and it would be up to Defansible or Rook to make sure that it provided an implementation of the command that matched Tuthology's expectation. So basically saying, and it didn't, wouldn't have to be built into the orchestrator as such, it could be like yeah, something that you run yeah, when you're testing. It sounds like, a, like you have to, have to provide a, a task that implements the interface. No, no, no. It's, the, the, point is, the point is that you don't have you don't have um, one piece of software that has multiple ways of doing things, right? So um, Rook would have one way that it exposes its hooks for testing, and that would be the Tuthology way. And Tuthology would have one way that it calls into things to access the hooks, and that would also be the Tuthology way. Um, 
And if you had, you know, one orchestrator and one toothology, you would have, you know, one interface. You would you wouldn't have like a plugins directory in either piece of software. Right. This is basically shifting the the responsibility of doing things to other parties instead yeah. of having that responsibility so, in tautology. Basically so, define so, semantics and hope everyone else will implement those semantics. And so I get that. It just it seems like a much more natural interface boundary is to say, like, Toothology is going to expect to have a module named in this fashion that you drop into a directory somewhere, and then it invokes these functions on it in this way. And that and that's the interface, and that's all that we, like, the Toothology test orchestrator or we when writing tasks write against. But that seems much more natural than, like, specifying some callout that we have to, like, and then you require an API endpoint or something. I, it depends, I think that's... Um, just, just briefly, it, it depends on how complex the implementation of the hook is. So like if the hook for taking down a service in Rook involves not just doing something inside Rook, but also like fiddling around inside Kubernetes, you might find that to implement that as a .py file in inside Toothology would actually potentially be impossible because it can't reach the internals it needs to reach. Um, as opposed to in the legacy environments where everything is just SSH and your root everywhere, and you can just go do anything you want. Um, so that would be the reason for moving the functionality physically outside of Toothology, which might only have limited access to the internals of the Kubernetes cluster and into Rook, where it can actually definitely do everything it needs to do. What I mean, but in that case, then the then the Python file for Rook is just a thin thing that says, like, invoke this command on some endpoint. And we right, can... but at the, point that we've, at the point that we've moved to Rook providing that nice remote call interface, let's have everyone provide the nice remote call interface, is, I guess is what I'm saying. I, I, want, I want other people to look more like Rook. <laughs> I'm actually interested in knowing what Zach thinks about the, this whole thing, because... Well, you know, we've been discussing a lot about tautology and how things, but I don't think anyone here knows tautology better than Zach. So, yeah, unfortunately, that's still true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, as far as I know, um, so to, to to respond to to what you what you guys were just Im immediately talking about. Um, I think whittling whittling things like uh, process management down to a single supported interface um, makes me a little nervous because I, I and I can't I can't promise that this is the case, but I feel I I feel like there are tests that we run that want um, demons to disappear in a very non graceful fashion, um, and so so if if the only way of say taking down a monitor is is to go through this this shim that tells Rook to do a certain thing. Um, does that really does that really work the same way? Um, I, 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 I feel like I feel like at some I, level you're going to need to just jump in somewhere and kill dash nine something. Or right, and that can still be done with with Rook. Like I actually see that w w this is better because you know for running on bare metal you just ssh you kill dash nine but for rook you have to like find where that pod lives you have to i mean you have to attach to that pod and then you can kill dash nine it but you also have to make sure that rook isn't going to restart that pod and so you know maybe you have to simulate what that uh health check looks like and you always just return hey my pod is healthy but inside of the container the daemon is killed but to have toothology have to know how to do that it seems uh, like if you take that to the extreme you know if you have like rook and then something else and then something else and then something else then toothology has to know how to do that for every single back end when really all toothology wants to do is to kill dash nine in that process yeah, yeah, no, I, I hear that, but um, so I think that um, to uh, I want to touch on the the idea of of only supporting one installer method at a time. Um, I think that even if we switched, even if 
you know, Ceph upstream um, was solidly solidly on Rook tomorrow, and we had rewritten the parts of Toothology that we needed to to support Rook exactly how we wanted it to. We would still, for several years, at least downstream, at least at Red Hat, you know, we would still have to test everything, all of the, you know, in all the different ways that it that it used to work because we have customers on those systems and and testing with entirely different test frameworks upstream versus downstream um, is is um, pretty far from ideal in my view i, I just think it, even from, from a resource standpoint um, is it not already the case that our without wanting to i don't know divulge anything commercially sensitive are our customers in the field are using systems that were installed using set ansible or or other make means mostly, but we are still doing most of our testing using Toothology's own idea of how to install Ceph. Is it not already the case that we're doing most of our testing with a different install me mechanism than customers actually use? Well, that um, is probably true. I want to be clear that there is a Red Hat down, there is a, Re it's actually public, but there's a Red Hat fork of Toothology that does testing with Ceph Ansible, and it's caused us a lot of grief in our ability to harmonize work. Um, do they, but they, don't they do like a subset of the type of testing they do? Do they have like a thrasher that works with Ansible? I uh, wish I could answer that well, question. I so, <laughs> I mean, I, I suspect not, right? So no, I, I think but, let's not I mean, overestimate well, what we already did. So if, that, so if that were the case, then you might imagine that to be a, a, a problem for Red Hat as an entity that they wanted to resolve. <laughs> And that there were people getting pressured to fix that, <laughs> and that if it was fixed, there might be a lot more resources available for upstream testing. And yeah. So, so what what we're tightly. looking at, at least internally with our downstream testing, and I don't I don't have nearly as much information as as I ideally would about it, but um, yeah, it's it it's a fork. Um, it is not it is not like extremely different from what's upstream. But it's different enough to cause complications, and so I, I kind of see that as like a preview of what you know what might happen if if we just if we dumped it upstream, rewrote something entirely you know different, um, our problems would be that much larger when we try to say, well, you know, this particular this particular scenario was just fine upstream. What happened when we applied ten patches to it or whatever uh, to try to ship it as the product? Um, and it's not just our downstreams. Like we found out that there were like three other people, other companies running, running Tutology just at, and who showed up at Cephalicon. Um, right. And the more right. drastic change, the harder it is for them, and the less likely we are to get them to cooperate with us instead of redundantly going off and doing their own localizations and sitting on their own thing for fork for forever. Um, I mean, right. even the people in the room were on forked versions of Tutology. And so the what I'm not getting though is what in this conversation seems to be a blocker for reconverging is if if what John was suggesting actually comes into place, what we're talking about here is to define operations that have certain semantics and whatever is happening will whatever is using datology will just have to comply with those semantics i i get that there's already code implemented and re-implementing that code in a different way is it, it seems wasteful but the, so there's, the truth there's is a whole that bunch of different dimensions there's Uthology right now is a is is a system for writing and running tests it's a right. system for managing a lab and for scheduling tests, it's a system. Well, I guess those are the right. most of them. So it would be good to unplug those. Um, but there are sort of operational issues, like from a community perspective, and and one is like, and that's something I'm trying to do is like get more of a step testing and tutology community going, so that like hopefully all the different labs in the world can start working together. Um, but so it could be that, for instance we can reduce the number of homegrown services we have as part of Tutology by switching to use Kubernetes as 
as the provider for a bunch of that, entirely independent from whether we use Kubernetes, whether we test Rook inside of it or not. Um, but a lot of the manpower available to Ceph testing is not is not pulling in the same direction and isn't working together because they have specific requirements about how they test that are not that will certainly not be met by the Kubernetes vision that John has. And I mean that's fine, but it's something that we want to like make a choice about. Now what I'm hearing out of this meeting so far is that like my my more short-term goals have been to set up like internal Tuthology APIs around how we do daemon management and install and and then like implement different installers and at least the API part all sounds like it'll still be good once we do this. Um, but there's there's like immediate technical aspects, there's long-term maintenance aspects, and there's and there's community management aspects. Um, and the community here is like, you know, the Red Hat QE people, the SUSE QE people, us in this room, um, Flipkart, DreamHost, I, uh, that place where Robin went, I forget their name, um, right? And and the more available we are to all of those groups, I think the more successful we'll be in the long term, even if it's a little bit of short term or a, a little bit of like local coding pain. So in that context, um, I think it. I think I would be more comfortable if we talked about um, we talked about this more in terms of separation of concerns um, rather than in terms of adding to tuthology as it exists today. So if we could think about um, that set of interfaces that you're writing for talking to different installers um, as as something that would be separated out. And, and you would have Tuthology and then some new service that would sit externally to Tuthology um, and provide that generic, you know, here are all the different knobs that Tuthology needs, and here is a couple of implementations that talk to different backends, then I think I would be more comfortable with that. Um, because if you talk about it in terms of like adding things to Tuthology, I just think, ah, oh, Tuthology is already too big. Okay, yeah. So, so can I, I just want to jump in here. Um, um, something that's been on my mind for quite some time, and 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 I, I haven't really been able to work on Tuthology in a long time, but but probably the first thing I would want to do if I did start working on it again is split it up. Um, so I, I think that a lot of you know the lab management stuff in Tuthology, you know, we, we're, we're still going to need that for the foreseeable future. Um, just taking this as one example, but. Why does it have to be in the same project? I, I would like—I would have liked to be able to iterate on on different components of Tuthology uh, I, without having to to worry about about the rest of it so much. If we had, if 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 it were split up into into sub components that had clearly defined interfaces between the between them, I think making changes like anything that we're talking about here would be a lot less daunting, because as it stands right now. You have to have much, much too large of an understanding of of like the entire behemoth that is Tuthology to to make any interesting changes. Um, does, I mean, does that sound at all attractive to you, John? Yeah, I mean, it's for me, it's it's about the sort of conceptual separation rather than like whether they're separate. Projects as such. I mean, it's probably from a practical point of view, we probably still want like one Git repository, for example. I know that can be a controversial thing, um, but it's. I mean, even actually running things as separate services that potentially have RPC between them, rather than having Python libraries, I think would be a big step forward. The trouble with the Python libraries approach is you never know what's calling what. Um, whereas if we could actually wrap things up in in services that use you know an rpc mechanism or something like that um then we can we can have not just that sort of separation of concerns but enforcement of it because you have a process boundary rather than a big mush of python code i say that as a big python fan but you know beyond a certain line of code count it does turn into a big mush yeah well i completely agree with that yeah absolutely I, i'd rather do I, i'd rather see interfaces that are more rpc like than just you know, import this library.
yeah, I I like so this. Does anyone as well. have any examples of where those boundaries might be? Um, I was like I got a pile of concerns, but I don't know if they match other people's. So so okay. like a couple of examples would be um, so what exists in the orchestra um, sub package there. Um, the things that we that the the so the the like the remote classes the things that we do that we use to invoke processes on remote machines um possibly even you know the power management related stuff could go into one service um the provisioner could be its own service um things like that yeah those would be the same two examples that i would use i mean i would say anything that currently uses ssh is a bare metal specific implementation detail that needs to be isolated. Um, and then you, you've got the sort of oh, the thing that... We, we do invoke SSH from our tasks right now. So I'd right. like an that we didn't invoke SSH directly, but like you want it to be a different service or just an inter, in, like a coding interface? You, I don't you can't know. SSH to a container. Anything that uses SSH yeah, yeah. today is right. an implementation detail. Right, but I mean, would you expect like, I, I don't understand what kind of call out boundary you're looking for there. Like I was envisioning just saying like, okay, so we switch to the, this command needs to run on this server and hopefully we can actually do that because because of the right, or maybe we're going to do the test like the Thrasher tests a lot, which is possible. But like this command needs to run on the server, like make that happen. And then just depending on, and then like it would be set up as part of the install task or something, what you're pointing at, whether it's SSH or whether it's, um, I don't know how Kubernetes does that. But. Yeah, it, it needs to be a little bit more abstract than run a command because um, think if the command is something like kill dash nine, then that's probably not going to be the right thing for what the caller actually wants to happen. Um, whereas with commands like run setfs journal tool or run you know rbd tool. Um, those things really are just like commands, right? So you would have some generic thing that was like, go run a Ceph binary with admin permissions, which would be what we would use to invoke all the tools. And that um, on bare metal, that would probably do something like SSH into a monitor mode, uh, monitor mode. And on Kubernetes, it would do something like executing on the Ceph tools container. Um, but that's just, that's just one example, right? So it's not as general as just run a command. But it's also not super specific, not, right? There are these broad categories. Me, it's just like that is running within one process. And so you're talking about like multiple processes for boundaries. And I wasn't sure if you meant there or like in the scheduling versus provisioning versus running the test thing, which all make more sense to me as independent services. So so uh, another thing another thing that might deserve to be uh its own sort of service is uh there is I I'm trying to remember the name of this 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 task it's the Ceph manager i think and it existed before the manager daemon did <clears throat> excuse me and it has methods that let you do things like stop you know osds and whatnot if if that were its own service it it, it could it could know about some of these things um, right now it's it's a thing that's created as a side effect of the i believe the install task or the Ceph task i, I forget um, but if it were elevated to be like you know, a, a top level pathology component or whatever word you want to use, it, it might be able to just grow a little bit more knowledge um, and be useful. Yeah, that's certainly the natural home for most of that functionality because that's where a lot of it is actually already being passed through from. Like most most OSD kill dash nines actually run through there, and it's got the only invocations of direct invocations of the process. Right, because I don't think the tasks themselves are doing a whole lot of that. I could be wrong there. No, I I thought they were, and I I like I was grepping for Ceph OSD and Ceph MDS and Ceph Mon last night, and it only turns up like basically in that file like six times each or like two times each or something. So we're actually in better. In that great shape, but better than I thought. And to, to enter the Kubernetes world, those are going to have to change regardless. Yeah. Okay, so oh. just because at least I'm running out of time, um, 
did we reach out the consensus with regard to how we're going to test this on Kubernetes? <laughs> yeah, we've had a sharing of ideas. Um, I got to tell you, I'm like running a Red Hat, like downstream focused, but general how we do testing. Um, I don't know. It's called a DFG, which doesn't mean anything. The Tiger team sort of thing. Um, and we're not to tutology yet, although we will be. And so like my definitely my personal interest is I think just going to be setting up internal interfaces and because like I need, I need to make it so we've tested stuff Ansible um, in, in the lab. Um, but, you know, those I think will all be useful tools, whichever way we end up going with Kubernetes here. Um, I do have one other thing I'd like us to think about, which is, and which I definitely don't have an answer to, but what, what running on Kubernetes, like as the cold cluster manager would mean for um, people who aren't Red Hat or SUSE, um, or even who are, or, or even for us, like in terms of testing the changes we make to the system, like to, would we have to start deploying Kubernetes inside of public OpenStack clouds if you don't have physical hardware, or is it, even remotely not insane to test it inside of the Google or Amazon Kubernetes clouds or, or whatever. It's, um, it's totally fine to test it on, on Google's stuff. Like that's well, one of the, I one of the reasons things that it was mostly oh, was price wise. I, I don't know, make, make a friend at Google. They have these vouchers they hand out. <laughs> they, they hand them out like candy. You go to one of their workshops and you get like $500 on their cloud. Sorry, that's not very practical of me. <laughs> Just, we clearly we we all just need to each hire someone whose job it is to go to these things and and collect the vouchers. I volunteer. I, I I'm okay with that as long as I have travel budget. I'm totally okay with that. <laughs> yes, let's cycle our travel budget into cloud compute. Yeah. Okay. Um, we should we okay. should work on the assumption that if somebody's providing a managed Kubernetes service, then it will have a comparable cost to running our own managed Kubernetes service for ourselves. It might cost more in dollars, but. Yeah, okay. Um, anyway, okay. no firm conclusions, but that was, I think that was useful for me. I hope it was useful for other people. We do this I, meeting, I, although often it's more about merging two GPRs than in, in details than, than this, so yeah. please come back. <laughs> I, I think this was interesting to at least understand whether we are converging or diverging. Yeah. And Just... I, I think I think there is some conversion, which or at least some room to actually attempt that conversion. Huh? Conversion? Convergence. Am I use... Convergence. I'm sorry, I, I'm not using English properly. Um, conversion is when you change from one religion to another. Yes, I, th that's what was <laughs> sounding so weird, you know. But anyway, um, I'm getting tired, so allow me some. Like, anyway. Um, okay, I think we can follow up this at some point. All right. Thanks so much, guys. I will yeah. see you Thank around. You. Thank you.